And good evening and welcome to this week's edition of the Pete Mazzetti Show. My guest this evening is State Senator Paul Formica. Senator Formica, welcome. How are you? I'm wonderful. Good How to see you, you again. Good, I'm great, thanks. Good I'm to great. see you again. Thanks for having me back. Thanks for coming down. It's been a while. Yes, it has. It's been a while. Yes, it has. So, to, so, recent, so lately, we're going to start the beginning of the 2019 legislative session. Let's talk about what you're expecting to happen in this upcoming session and maybe before we get into that, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and how long you've been state senator and what areas you represent. Well, thank you very much. I represent uh, the 20th district, okay. uh, which is a portion of Old Saybrook, Old Lyme, East Lyme, Waterford, New London, a portion of uh, Montville, Basra, and Salem. And uh, there are 36 Senate districts in the state. Each of us represent about 100,000 people. And uh, I have, I think, the best district in the uh, in the state along the shoreline there it's wonderful mm -hmm. and beautiful and an up-and-coming city in new london and mm -hmm. right. uh, i've lived there for you know forty some odd years so uh... i'm happy to be uh, i'm happy to be a part of it uh... i opened my business in nineteen eighty three and i began to get involved in the community my wife got involved uh, in all those things you do when you have four kids under seven oh yeah and uh... one of the things led me into uh, the Zoning Commission, mm -hmm. where I served eight years and eight years on finance and then was elected first selectman in the town of East Lyme. So I have 23 years of uh, service in the town of East Lyme. And four years ago, I was elected to my first term uh, in the state Senate. Uh, the vacancy occurred when uh, Senator Stillman retired and uh, I ran and was lucky enough and privileged enough to win and uh, beginning my third term uh, Right now, there and, you go. You and, like it? You like it up there? You know, it's it's such a wonderful experience to be able to to be able to serve the people in the state of Connecticut in this way. I, as I said, opened my business all those years ago with never a thought of politics or serving in any capacity, much <laughs> less, you know, being uh, having a seat in the state senate and just the greatest country in the world when you can when you can do stuff like that. So, exactly. So. Um, we have a different situation occurring in the Senate this year. Last year, the session was, uh, the last sessions are two years at a time. Yeah. Uh, January to June is the long session, and then the second year, February to May, is the short session. Mm -hmm. And the first session is, uh, as I said, January to June, we begin uh, to put together a two-year budget, which is approved sometime during this session, and it lasts uh, throughout the two-year term and next year there's a little bit of modification and uh, this past session that just expired there was a historic tie in the Senate uh, 18 Democrats and 18 Republicans It was the first time in, wow. in uh, 30 some odd years that there was shared actually the first time since uh, 1897 there was a tie in the Senate but there was the first time that the Democrats were not in control in about 30 35 years so we were able to get some great things done because we had equal voices and we had a seat at the table the House uh, of Representatives was 79 Democrats 72 Republicans which meant four votes made a difference mm -hmm. uh, so there was a lot more conversation and communication and compromise collaboration uh, and it produced what I think the best to be the best budget uh, in 30 years in Connecticut's history and wow. we're in the middle of that now so um, I'm hopeful uh, as we move into this session where the people in the state of Connecticut voted to return the majority to the Democrats there's now 23 Senate Democrats and 13 <coughs> Senate Republicans okay. Uh, we can talk about some interesting uh, facts about who's coming in in a minute, but sure. but also 92 uh, House members and uh, uh, for that are Democrat, and I believe it's uh, 59 uh, Republicans. Those two numbers should add up to 151. But right. so it's going to be a different ball game, and the majority party mm -hmm. appoints the chairman of all the committees. There are 27 committees okay. up there in the legislature, and. Again, last year when we had a tie, we were able to be co-chairs because there was no majority. Exactly. So there was a seat for each party. This year, the, uh, we will be known as a ranking member, okay. which means I'll be the highest serving 
uh, Republican on appropriations, where this past year I was the co-chairman, and I'll also be uh, the ranking member on energy, where last session I was the co-chairman. So it'll be a different approach to how we legislate, and you know, the, as they say, majority rules, right? So they have the opportunity to pass um, whatever, uh, whatever they like, and we're hopeful to be able to stand up and you know, provide our thoughts in a reasonable way and, and hope that they'll listen and take some, some of those thoughts to heart and find them in legislation. Now, who, was you, who, who, were, your, who were your chairman of the committees that you were on last session? So last session, I was co-chair uh, of energy with yeah. uh, uh, the House co-chairman was uh, Lonnie Reed, okay. uh, right down the street in Brantford. She's mm -hmm. a great representative, sure. very knowledgeable in energy. Uh, she retired, didn't run again, so we won't see her this session. Okay. Uh, and uh, Gary Winfield, who was a, a long-serving senator uh, on the Democratic side from New Haven. And we okay. had a very, sure. very good bipartisan um, uh, rapport there in, in the energy and this time with the new majority uh, you know the local guy who represents uh, here in Westbrook Norm Needleman that's right that's he's right. the first selectman out in Essex and yep. now the new state senator of the 20 uh, the 33rd district that's right and he will be the chairman Senate chairman of energy okay and um, a guy by the name of David Arconti who is a representative from Danbury will be the house chairman Okay. And, uh, you know, I get along wonderfully well. I've known uh, Mr. Needleman for 30 plus years. And oh, yeah. so I'm hopeful that we'll have uh, the opportunity to take our friendship and understanding of each other and, <laughs> and turn that into positive legislation for the uh, state of Connecticut. Yeah, Mr. Needleman's a very nice guy. I've met, yeah. him, met him a couple of times. Very talented man. Very. Now, let me, let, me ask, let me ask you this. You said last session that there were ties in the Senate. If there's a if there's a tie vote, I believe it's the lieutenant governor who breaks the tie. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. If there's a bill that's uh, that's tied and that happened maybe half a dozen times, okay, the lieutenant governor would uh, would break the tie. And you know, she always she was being a Democrat, uh, serving under Governor Malloy, who mm -hmm. was a Democrat. Right. It actually was you know they were considered the majority, even though we had equal seats in the right. Senate, and uh, she did in fact vote all those times with the, with the Democrat side on those issues. Now, with the legislative session about to start for 2019, what do you, per, what do you as Senator Formica want to get done or see done in the upcoming legislative session? Well, you know, again, I'm back on appropriations, which yeah. is the expenditure side of the budget. There's, okay. uh, we handle all the, uh, all the expenses from the agencies and, and uh, you know, the the union contracts and, and all of that. And then the Revenue Finance and Bonding Committee right. brings in the revenue and mm -hmm. handles that. And they actually operate separately. So I'd like to see a little more collaboration between those two. You know, here in you know the town of Westbrook and Old Saybrook and in East Lyme, where I'm from, uh, the Board of Finance figures out the revenue and then decides what the exp uh, what the expenses are. Okay. In the state, we do things kind of differently. You know, right. they have one group working on the numbers that you're going to spend, and another group working on the numbers that are coming in. So it, there needs to be a little more collaboration. But you know, I said before when we were last session, 1818, we put together a budget uh, that I think is the best in in many years. We were able to negotiate in a spending cap. Okay. Uh, which means we can only spend so much money based on uh, last year and, and some indexes. Uh, a borrowing cap, we can only borrow $1.9 billion every year, which, you know, people say, oh my God, that's a heck of a lot of money. Uh, but uh, Governor Malloy borrowed, you know, almost $2.8 billion uh, in his last year there. So uh, we need to rein in some of those borrowings because you got to pay it back. Right. And uh, so we have that. And we also have in this budget what we call a volatility cap. And that was the brainchild of uh, Senate Democrat and Finance Chair John Fonfara from Hartford. And we worked collaboratively with him uh, to, to get that into the budget. And the volatility cap is simply this. When revenues come in and they exceed $3.125 billion, any money above that, has to go into the rainy day account, into the savings account. Okay. And we've been able to accumulate almost $2 billion 
uh, into the savings account as a result of that forced saving. So mm -hmm. uh, that money can't go on programs and it can't be spent. And that's something, uh, some fiscal discipline we need. You know, we try to keep seniors here in the state. Right. So in this budget, there is no tax on Social Security income uh, going starting in January of 2018. So we want to try to keep people from moving to tax friendlier states right. that don't tax Social Security. So Connecticut is now one of those states. And we invested in job training programs to, uh, so that our young people will stay here. So perhaps people like you and I, if we want to change careers, right. we can get job training and, and start filling some of these great manufacturing jobs we have. So we have a great budget in place. It's on its way. Uh, for a $275 million surplus uh, if, we, if we keep it the way it is. Uh, but it's an interesting budget year because, as you know, on January 9th, right. Governor uh, Malloy finished his term right. and Governor Lamont started his term. That's right. And so the budget mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in <coughs> Connecticut state government works from July 1 to June, June 30th. 30th. That's right. So in this case, when you switch executives like we have this year, Governor Malloy would oversee the budget until January 9th, and then from January 9th to June 30th, now Governor Lamont right. will be taking the reins of the budget. So there'll be some interesting dynamics as to how, how those two governors approach this budget differently, even though the General Assembly has voted uh, on uh, where the money goes and how it comes in and uh, the governor, Malloy, had signed it into law. So it's one of those interesting little quirks uh, of government. Exactly. Senator Fermico, would you mind sticking around for your last segment? I would love to. We'll Thank you. We'll be right back. Planning the right amount of food is hard. The guesstimator makes it easy. Just tell it who's coming and what's for dinner. Then it tells you how much to make. And yes, it even plans for leftovers. Try it at savethefood.com. Patriotism. It inspires passionate debate. It's worn like a badge of honor with good reason. Because it means love and devotion for one's country. But what really makes up this country of ours? It's the people. To love America is to love all Americans. This year, patriotism shouldn't just be about pride of country. It should be about love, love beyond age, sexuality, disability, race, religion, and other labels. Because love has no labels. And good evening and welcome back to this week's edition of the Pete Mazzetti Show. Sitting here with Senator Paul Formica. Senator Formica, welcome back. Thank you. Thank Pleasure you. to be here. Thanks for sticking around. So, Senator Formica, we were talking during the break about if you are a basically a commissioner for one of the agencies and we have a new governor coming in you have to be reappointed by the governor for to your commission but you also have to be okayed or accepted by the legislature is it just a how does that work so uh the governor appoints the leaders of his agencies. Right. Uh, so he appoints the commissioners mm -hmm. and then they get vetted uh, through a committee okay. uh, and then voted on in either the House or the Senate, sometimes both, depending on uh, which, which one it is. And in this particular case, mm -hmm. um, uh, Governor Malloy appointed a number of people. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of his <coughs> term, everyone submits their resignation. Right. And it's up to the incoming governor to accept the resignation uh, or to reject the resignation and ask the person who is in the position to stay on. And I believe uh, Governor Lamont mm -hmm. uh, has kept nine or ten of the commissioners and asked them to stay on in the capacity in which they're serving while he's looked outside and appointed uh, people uh, to uh, recommended appointment for people uh, to other commissionership jobs. In fact, there'll be three Democrat senators that will have resigned uh, to take positions in the uh, legislature. My understanding, there'll be uh, three uh, House representatives who mm -hmm. will resign their positions in the legislature to work for the Governor Lamont uh, coming in. So 
then when those appointments come to the legislature, there's an interview process okay. of a committee, uh, and that committee makes a recommendation, and it goes, uh, as I said, before the House or the Senate. So, you know, you asked me if it was a formality. Uh, in this particular case, with the large number majority mm -hmm. of Democrats, right. um, it, it kind of will be a formality right. because uh, most of the, the governor's party will vote I'm sure Working in lockstep right. for him and and you know and, and and listen I've looked over some of the names and mm -hmm. uh, there's some great quality individuals there and I oh, can yeah. see a unanimous vote on a number of those so and how long how long will that take uh, it shouldn't take too long because you know everybody's interested in moving on and exactly. getting uh, getting into the business of governing and right. you know it takes a little bit longer just because of the you know every four years there's just so many of them yeah and uh, so they'll have to be set up and reviewed and uh, uh, but it shouldn't take more than a month or so I think okay. to get things going that'll be the first order of business because uh, we want to get uh, get business going and I think the commissioners that um, are in place under Governor Malloy will either stay until they hand over the baton when, the, when it becomes official, or they'll go on to their next uh, opportunity and maybe a deputy commissioner will run the show for a few weeks uh, until the new commissioner has been uh, duly approved. Now with the new governor coming, in, coming on board, Governor Lamont coming on board here very shortly, what do you think, what do you think is gonna happen or what are your expectations for this upcoming legislative session? Well, as I thought, and, and I don't know if I mentioned in the first segment, but you know, we had an 18-18 tie, and we were very uh, optimistic about taking control of the Senate from the Republican point of view, uh, at least, and perhaps getting a governor uh, from a Republican point of view. So we were a little disappointed in the election as it turned out, but right. the people have spoken, and, and uh, Governor Lamont has come on, and, and he is doing, uh, I think, a lot of the right things. He's, he had some uh, many people uh, that he brought together uh, to create transition teams mm -hmm. uh, that advised him on policy uh, and recommended uh, pathways for him to move. He's talked uh, in terms of uh, being very bipartisan and inclusive, uh, even though we're you know clearly in the minority as Republicans. He's he's reached out. Our leader, Senator Len Fasano of North Haven, has uh, had conversations with Governor Lamont. I met with the governor when, uh, when he came up to New London just after he got elected and uh, talked about ways to revitalize our city. So I'm optimistic about uh, the fact that he really wants to change and be inclusive and really move Connecticut forward. But uh, you know, he has, he has a tough job in front of him and you know, he'll have conflicting interests. You know, people that, that uh, he represents or wanna, wanna spend and tax and uh, you know, they have a number of legislative ideas that they want to go forth that might be a bit controversial. Now, how do we think the budget's looking for the 2019 well, session? Well, uh, you know, our budget, let's just say that they don't mess with the budget that we have and we mm -hmm. end up with a surplus 200 or 300 million. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, w we could, uh, we're looking at a $1.5 billion deficit in the next budget. All right. And the second year, somewhere similar to that. So, um, you know, if, if we can get a budget that stimulates interest in the economy for business, that creates jobs, that keeps seniors here, uh, and uh, we don't, you know, punish people with new taxes or tolls or, um, you know, uh, you know, and we can move things forward, then we can take some of those uh, surpluses that we're going to see and mm -hmm. apply them to the back pension debt and reduce those deficits. And it's going to take a couple of years to get it done. But, you know, in two or three or four years, we, we have the opportunity of, of wiping out the deficit, of reducing our pension obligations and, and uh, really moving the state of Connecticut forward. And now, as far as tolls go, what are your thoughts, feelings? Well, you know, back when tolls were initially <laughs> talked about some years ago, uh, it was an idea that was used to raise revenue to fix our roads and bridges and right. then either eliminate or reduce the gas tax. Mm -hmm. Well, now the conversation is let's, let's have tolls and let's increase the gas tax. And that came from Governor Malloy. Governor Lamont has said, listen, we want to tax, uh, we want to toll only truckers. Yes. But Rhode Island has done that and they're faced with 
uh, a law challenge, a lawsuit. The truckers are challenging uh, Rhode Island, and that simply because in their argument is this. Uh, if you're only going to toll us, you charge us for truck permits. You may notice on the side door of every truck there are these numbers. Those mm -hmm. are permit numbers. And tens of millions of dollars are paid by truckers to drive through Rhode Island uh, then have those permits, which are road use fees. So if you're just going to add that on as a toll and a tax, they're challenging it. So Governor Lamont is wise to look at the results of that lawsuit uh, and see if that'll happen. But there is a plan from the DOT to have 82 toll gantries here, which will make us the highest tolled uh, roads in the country. Right. Um, now listen, we're, we're doing that because the Special Transportation Fund uh, is running out of money. Mm -hmm. And we were able in this current budget to move some money, uh, money that's generated from the sales tax on new automobiles that was diverted many years ago from the Special Transportation Fund, which is a separate fund paying for infrastructure, right. and the General Fund, which pays for operational things such as the agencies you talked about. Yeah. Um, but that money from the sales tax of new automobiles used to go to the transportation fund and some years ago they moved it to the general fund. So we moved some of it back to try to feed uh, the special transportation fund and revigorate that. We also have a plan called Prioritize Progress, which is a, a Republican plan that we conceived as a capital improvement plan to fix roads and bridges without taxes or tolls. And this is how it works. Okay. There is about three to five hundred million dollars every year of discretionary bond funding that the governor can use to pay for special projects. Our idea is to divert money away from those special projects and use them to fund bonding infrastructure for roads and bridges, which are more important. That creates jobs, it will rebuild our infrastructure, rebuild our roads and bridges. In fact, in this budget there's a hundred million dollars uh, of that opportunity. So. We think that it's better to tighten your belt in one area and then spend some money that's already been allocated uh, in, in the bond form to uh, borrow and build our roads and bridges. So, um, you know, the, the lockbox initiative was on right. the ballot, was yep. just passed. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that means any money that goes in the special transportation fund has to be used for that purpose. That's right. So, and I, from what I, let's talk about the lockbox and how exactly how it works and what it is. So a lockbox is kind of, um, <clears throat> it, it's kind of a way to protect the legislature from the legislature. Uh, in other words, uh, for many, many years in 2011 to 2015, before my time, mm -hmm. $496 million was diverted from taxes raised specifically for infrastructure for roads and bridges and it was supposed to go into the special transportation fund. Okay. They say they didn't take it out of the transportation fund and they're correct except for one year there was 50 million but 496 million was diverted. It never got there. <laughs> oh. It was raised with the intention of going there and it never got there. So that created the stress and it created the fact that listen we got to find a way that to one if we have a tax that's supposed to fund infrastructure, roads, and bridges, mm -hmm. let's make sure it does its job. So we put it in the Special Transportation Fund, and when it gets there, it can't be used for anything else. And that's what the lockbox says. But people don't realize in the Special Transportation Fund sits the Department of Motor Vehicles ah. and the Department of Transportation. They're paid out of that fund and not the general fund where all the other agencies um, such as the revenue services yep. and DEP, they all come out of the, the general fund. I did not know that. I, yeah. so, so we think our plan uh, is, is the way forward. We don't think we need tolls, uh, but I'm afraid that uh, tolls are one of the things that the majority party is interested in putting in. Um, it will take three or four or five years to, to, to generate, and, and I mean, I don't know how much time we have, but I'll give you some brief history. Go for it, go for it, yeah. 1983, you may remember the horrific accident that occurred in the southwest part of the state at the toll booths where some were killed, and it was the impetus for removing tolls from mm -hmm. Connecticut's roads. Right. Well, there was a deal made back then with the Federal Highway Administration, and it said, if Connecticut decides to put tolls back, right and they put it around the border, mm -hmm. there would be a penalty. 
And for not having tolls on our roads, we get a higher percentage back for every federal, uh, every tax dollar that we send to the feds through the highways that are generated. Okay. Right now, Connecticut gets about 73 cents back on every dollar. And toll states such as Massachusetts and New Jersey uh, and uh, New York, mm -hmm. they get back 35 cents. So the deal said that if we put tolls only around the borders, and that's what the argument is, people say, you know, we come in from New York and we drive through Rhode Island, we don't even stop in Connecticut, people should pay right. for that privilege. Well, if we just did that and didn't put tolls anywhere in the middle of Connecticut, mm -hmm. we'd have to pay back the delta between the 35 and 73 cents to the feds since 1983. And that's not something uh, we want to do, and that's wow. why the toll plan on the, on the table includes tolls on Route 8 and Route 9 and Route 2 and Route, route 11 and uh, wow. you know, all of the inner roads as well as 91, 85, 84. Uh, so you know, it's a difficult subject. Uh, I think uh, yeah. we'll make an argument against them, but I'm not sure that we can win it. Wow, it sounds like it's going to be a very interesting and busy legislative session. Well, I think there's a, there's a lot of things that are coming. The recreational marijuana will be talked about mm -hmm. being legalized. And, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, gambling and increasing uh, online gambling. In fact, I was, uh, you know, I'm going to co-sponsor a bill to, to have uh, some online and sports gambling, but only in the casinos, in the resort casinos. So they can, they can keep it there where the gambling is. And, and uh, you know, so we'll, we'll have some conversations about that. That sounds like it's going to be a very jam-packed session. Well, We've got you know, a little bit more time. What else would you like to... Well, we'd love to have you up and visit Absolutely. Uh, in the session. And, Absolutely. That would um, be fun. You know, as I said, I'm going to be on the Energy Committee and the Appropriations Committee, but I'll also be on executive nominations, so I'll be one of the people reviewing some of the new appointees, and I'll be serving as a co-chairman of the Tourism Caucus, which I founded in 2015. And I have a, have a meeting this week about co-chairing the, the IDD caucus, which is the uh, developmentally disabled, uh, which has got a, uh, you know, a special place in my heart. So I was asked to co-chair that and I will, be, uh, I will be doing that. So I'm gonna have my hands full. And I know you talked to my great aide, Kim. I did. And uh, so she's gonna have her hands full as well. So there we go. Senator for me, Kevin, thank you for coming down. We'll see you again soon. Well, thank you. And thank I hope you. I really want you to come visit. We will. All right. On behalf thank of Paul Formica, I'm Pete Mazzetti. Thanks, good night. We'll see you next time.